In the meantime, this morning for our study, let's get back to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I'm very excited about this study. Does anybody remember where we are in the book of Acts? What's going on in the book of Acts, friends? Where are we at? It's been weeks. Pentecost. What is significant about Pentecost, Robert? Yeah. When the Spirit came for the birth of the church, right? And why would it be important, beloved, that we understand the origin of the local church? It's a commandment. Yeah. To know what a church looks like. I mean, you're not, I mean, you're not going to get much better than its purest form on its first Sunday, in one sense. I mean, it's immature, it's limited, it has to grow, which we see in the book of Acts. But its purest representation right here is in Acts 2. And Acts 2, beloved, if you think about it, it's really almost all of the passage is about a half a day. And then it unfolds for the first week of church life. So really, you've got here in Acts 2... Verse 1 all the way to verse 47 really covers about a half a day in the life of the early church. But so much happens, and there's so much here that's significant. To miss this half a day, I think, is to misunderstand what you need to really know about local church life, who you are right now in Jesus Christ, what you should be spending your time on, how you should live. In fact, I'm going to quote Martin Lloyd-Jones again as he talks about Acts 2. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a a pastor in London for many years in the mid-1950s and beyond. And he has this interesting quote that he says about the day of Pentecost, and I think it's important for us to think about. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, The day of Pentecost was a most notable and vital day for the Christian church. And it was also one of the great turning points in the history of the world. Think about that statement. We are studying studying the great turning points in the history of the world. That is the church being born. He says this. Now now listen closely, beloved. If you want to know why you need to pay close attention today, listen to this. Without understanding it, what happened in Pentecost, it is quite impossible to have any correct notion as to the character and nature of the Christian church and the Christian message. In Acts 2, we have the first sermon that was ever preached under the auspices of the church, and therefore, it is of unusual importance. End quote. I agree with that, beloved. That this is a passage of unusual importance, because what we are seeing is when God from heaven sends his spirit, after Jesus goes up, he sends the spirit back down, and the spirit births the first church, and the spirit starts the process, as we'll look at in a moment, of sending these miraculous signs to wake everybody up that God is among his people. And then after the spirit comes, the first spirit-empowered Christian sermon is preached. And you are about to see and study on the pages of scripture today the first Christian sermon ever preached. And it is an incredible sermon. It results in, if you notice, the end of this sermon, if you just want to see the result of it before we study it, go down in Acts 2 and look at verse 37. We're going to study all the way 1 to 36 this morning. And in 37, look what concludes after the first Christian sermon. Now when they heard this, heard what? The first sermon ever preached by those new followers of Christ, those disciples who had been given the fullness of the Spirit and dwelled their life, Peter preaches his sermon, and when they heard this, verse 37, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? By the time we're done this morning, the culmination of this sermon resulted in 3,000 People cut to the heart wanting to respond to this message and come to know Jesus Christ Messiah. It's the first Christian sermon that results in the birth of the church because churches are born by God saving people. And when those people are saved, God raises up leaders and they're shepherded and then those churches spread out to evangelize. Here's the birth of the first one. 
If you're taking notes, we've been calling this little all of Acts chapter 2, the birth of the church, and I said it's displayed through eight stunning scenes. Eight stunning scenes. If you just look at Acts 2 really quick, you want to look down at it. The first scene was the spirit exploding from heaven upon those sitting down. We saw that in verses 1 to 4. You remember, that was a description of God from heaven sending the spirit on people that were just waiting. They were watching. They were sitting down there fellowshipping. God was trying to put an exclamation on point on, when a church is planted, it's me. Men didn't generate this. Scene 2 The Spirit empowers men to preach in foreign languages. That's in verses 4 to 11. And you remember what we saw? The Spirit came, right? There's this miraculous event where there's no meteorological shift. But what do you have? What happened? You had fire striking down like lightning. You had wind coming through like it was a, like it was a hurricane had come in there. And then you had the Spirit come upon people. And you had the apostles speaking in foreign languages that they had never known before, and they were speaking with such clarity and precision, it was as if they were from the native land of all the people that were listening. And you remember, the audience here is people that are here for the day of Pentecost. Some one million Jews come upon Jerusalem. Those Jews are spread out all over the world from Greece and beyond, and they speak all these different types of dialects, though Aramaic and Greek and Hebrew would be more common languages. But they had many different native tongues, and they come in to worship at Pentecost, this, this gathering to worship God. So you've got three, a, a million religious people showing up. Think about that. A million religious people. And their goal in coming is to come 50 days after Passover to worship the God they say they love. And they're about to be told in the first Christian sermon, the God you think you love, you've rejected. So we saw last time, look in verses 12 and 13, after the Spirit comes upon the men and the men start speaking in foreign languages, not their own, with such clarity that people were amazed, the crowd that had gathered to come see this event still was hard-hearted and in unbelief. Notice chapter 2, 12 and 13. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying they are full of sweet wine. You may think, ah, that's not, a very, that's not a very significant thing they just said. But I want you to think about something. Look at it again, verse 13. But others were mocking and saying they are full of sweet wine. We called that scene three, the crowd's magnetic response to the preaching. They weren't yet coming towards it. They were still pushing against it. Think about what they were doing. God from heaven just sent his spirit down and did a supernatural, miraculous event and came upon people with, 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 with um, lightning flashes and with a storm type of wind and they're speaking languages that had never been spoken by them to people that it was their actual language from their homeland. This supernatural, divine event happened And the response of the crowd was, they must be drunk. Notice verse 13. They were full of sweet wine. They just said that the supernatural work of God coming down from heaven should be attributed to what a man does in his flesh when he's drinking too much alcohol. This is not a good place they're in, is it? They just said to the God of the universe and to the apostles that know the truth, Oh, that, that you're saying that God's doing all of this? No, that looks more like someone after they've drank too much in the morning and they're drunk. That's what we're going to take and attribute this to. This is not a good place to be. In, the, in light of that, now we go in to scene four. Peter's thundering sermon to the perplexed and mocking. And this is the first Christian sermon. And like any sermon, as we're looking at today, you've got an outline. So let's look at the intro. And, and really, do you need an intro for this sermon? I mean, imagine if lightning bolts flashed up in the sky here, and wind came through here, and people started speaking in foreign languages. I wouldn't have to tell you guys to get coffee to pay attention. You'd be pretty locked in, right? Well, the, Peter's already got his intro. <laughs> the Spirit of God gave him an intro. Come and listen up. I am among my people. You better listen. But they still weren't listening. So Peter steps up for this first sermon, And by the way, 
when we see the intro upon the Spirit, you know, the Spirit coming for an intro, and then Peter kind of putting an exclamation point on it, when we look at the intro here, which is in verses 1 to 4, in, uh, excuse me, uh, in verses uh, 14 down to uh, 15, 14 and 15, here's what's interesting. Peter's about to step up, beloved, and speak with such courage and conviction and boldness. And 50 days earlier, there was a little schoolgirl that got him to reject his Messiah. So just notice this. Notice here. Here's the intro. This isn't exactly a seeker sensitive intro. Here's how I've titled his intro in verses 14 and 15 Men of Judea, you need to rethink your arrogant conclusions about what you just witnessed. That's his intro. You're saying that what the Spirit of God did should be attributed to men that are drunk. You need to rethink it. You're arrogant, you're proud, you're full of unbelief. That's quite the intro. Notice, but Peter, verse 14, taking his stand with the 11, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea and those in the surrounding area. So you got those Jews that are in Jerusalem and all those that have come in. Seems like he probably would have been preaching in Aramaic, which is the most common tongue that would have been known. But I want you to notice something. It says, taking his stand with the 11. You know why that would have been significant? The, the imagery there is him rising up to speak up as one with authority. Well, in life, in synagogues, they often preached sitting down, right? Jesus, we have in the Gospels, right, standing up to read the scripture, which means he was sitting down to give his exposition, so oftentimes what they do in rabbinic life is the person would sit to talk, but stand to read. It was their way to try and exalt the word of God. So when Peter stands up to preach, it's kind of all these Jews. Wow, he is speaking on behalf of God. But notice, he doesn't just take his stand. Look at it. He raises his voice and he declares to them. Raising his voice is language for authority. It's language for penetrating serious, sober-minded, straight-at-it preaching. Here's what you could say about it. They would have known that the man that's about to declare to them what God says is not messing around. (laughs) He is serious about responding to their accusation that they just accused the God of the universe that he didn't do something and attribute it to men as if they're drunk. He raised his voice, and notice, he declares. That is means he preaches Peter is preaching with boldness and courage. And then notice to these men of Judea and those surrounding in Jerusalem, he gives them two commands. Notice, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. Here's my translation. Settle in, be quiet, listen to me. Your souls are in peril if you do not repent. He is all about bringing them the truth. And what's interesting is, Notice who he's speaking to again. I found this fascinating. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem. Three times in this sermon, he addresses the men. And I found that interesting, right? It was the men who were behind the plot to help execute the Messiah. It's the men who are the leaders of their families. It's the men who will have fear of influence. And so while he addresses all, he comes straight for the men, particularly those that were most angry and arrogant, and says, men, you better settle down Listen up, I've got some words to you from the living God that you need to listen to, especially if you're going to attribute his sovereign work to drunkenness. Let this be known to you. Listen up, take heed to my words. Think about this for a second in your mind just to get a picture. The size of this group. If a million are in town and they gathered around and somehow he came down so he could preach and when he concludes after his sermon, 3,000 of that, however many are there, are converted. Think of the amplification (laughs) that it must have been for him to project himself out to this sea of unsaved Jews that were there to worship a God that he's about to tell them they're not worshiping. Now, I don't know about you, but I can struggle with fear, man. (laughs) I can lack courage. Peter is looking at this sea of souls, and he's about to come straight for them. And it's a massive audience. I mean, in a moment, if they just charged him, be done. I mean, it's not like he's got an opportunity. He's going to take on 3,000. I mean, he missed last time with a knife and cut off an ear when he was going for the head. (laughs) But (laughs) it's interesting. 
So, here he is. Peter here, first Christian sermon. The intro is, listen up, sit down. You're arrogant and you're proud and you really need to rethink the conclusion you made that what God did should be attributed to a man as if he was drunk. Notice what he says. For these men, verse 15, are not drunk, as you suppose. There it is. He's going back and revisiting their statement. You say they're full of sweet wine. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. For it is only the third hour of the day. Third hour of the day. Uh, Jewish calendar on the weekly schedule, the day starts at 6 a.m. So it's about 9 o'clock. And it's Pentecost, which is a time for worship. So not only would it be strange for someone to be drunk by 9 a.m., but during Pentecost, when they're setting apart their life to devote it to God, it would be totally unprecedented and uncharacteristic for someone to be drinking alcohol in the morning when they're there to be set apart for this week of the first festival. And then some believe, Jewish scholars believe, that actually the first time to eat a meal during this time of year, this day, and this calendar, would be about 10. So he's basically saying, prior to the meal... At Pentecost, even when it would be strange already to be drunk, you're attributing that these men are drunk? Are you kidding? It's 9 a.m. and we're at Pentecost. They're not drunk. But you're saying that, aren't you? Notice what he says. For these men are drunk. Verse 15. For you say these men men are drunk. I say they're not drunk, as you suppose. For it's only the third hour of the day. So, any good sermon, that's the intro. Sit down, listen up, you're arrogant and proud, you need to rethink the fact that you just said God's sovereign work from heaven should be attributed to men as if they were drunk. Then he's got five reasons they need to listen. Five reasons in his sermon, and we're going to finish these out today. If you want to take notes for Peter's first Christian sermon, and I'm preaching from Peter's sermon, here it is. Five reasons they need to rethink their conclusion they just made. Five reasons they need to rethink the conclusion they just made about the Spirit's work. Reason one, Joel, your own prophet, spoke of this day. Now think about that. He's about to go back and visit quotations from their own prophet. Now, do you know what would happen in synagogue life? You'd go into synagogue life. We don't really know how long it was, but someone would give a 15-minute explanation, and then they'd read through the Old Testament. And they would regularly read Old Testament literature, particularly even through the major and minor prophets, to be looking forward to the future Messiah. So when he goes right for one of their prophets, he's going for the juggler. You're rejecting what you just saw happen, but your own prophet that you've been sitting in on during the Sabbath, listening to, actually spoke of what's happening. Are you that hard-hearted and full of that much unbelief that you can't even see that your own prophet spoke of this? Notice what he says. Verse 16. But this, that this is this day of Pentecost, was spoken of through the prophet Joel. I'm going to read all the way down to 21. And it shall be in the last days, God says, notice that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. So those that were Jewish scholars should have immediately been cluing in. Oh man, I was just at, you know, temple last week and I I just heard the prophet Joel read and what I just said should be attributed to drunk, drunken men. Is it really a fulfillment of this? Am I really rejecting scripture right now? Am I rejecting the God of the Old Testament? I say I worship? Yikes. No wonder they're pierced to the heart. This is just the beginning. I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall see dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit and they shall prophesy and I will grant wonders in the sky above. They're thinking, I just saw wonders in the sky above. There was lightning bolts flashing in the air and there was no lightning. There was wind coming through and there was no storm and signs on the earth below. Just saw it. And then, He begins to transition a bit into some of what happened here and then some of what's going to happen in the last days. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that is a a fascinating thing to think about. Let's just think about this prophecy for a little bit because you may be sitting here saying, okay, I could see how some of that prophecy, right, goes with what just happened. You had lightning bolts, you had wind, you had this this incredible event that came down, you had people speaking prophetically. But then you've got all the language here talking about 
the great day of the Lord, the great and glorious day that shall come, and everyone who calls on the normal name of the Lord will be saved. Well, this is a quote from Joel 2. So it's important you understand what's going on here. And I need to, you need to focus, focus with me for a second because I'm going to ask a lot from your mind for a second. But in Joel chapter 2, the context there is God, Joel speaking through God about the day of the Lord. And if you've read your Old Testament, you've probably seen this major theme in prophets about the great and glorious day of the Lord. Have you not? You read about the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord is the second coming of Christ when he comes to set up his earthly eternal kingdom and two things are going to happen. He is going to absolutely bring justice and vengeance and retribution against every single person that was his enemy. And he's also, as this ends here, he's going to bring salvation to all of his people. And so what you have here that Peter's doing is he's taking um, part of the prophecy, because we're heading into the last days here in Peter's mind and in Jesus' ministry, and he applies it to this event because this is what's starting and, and furthering this time of the last days, which I'll show you in a moment. But it's not the full fulfillment of this prophecy until the last day. You say, well, why is Pre Peter showing a partial fulfillment of a prophecy? And why doesn't he just stop there? Why does he show it all? Well, because he wants to do two things. He wants, one, to show them, you missed Joel's prophecy. He spoke of this day. But two, if you keep missing Joel's prophecy... A day will come when the Jesus you just executed is going to ride down on a white horse and bring vengeance to all of his enemies. And guess what? Executing him makes you his enemy. And he wanted them to see the significance of that. So how, how we know that's going on is I want you to look here at what Peter says, the, the prophecy being just applied here and then extended. In verse 16, notice it says, or 17, he says, and it shall be in the last days. The actual prophecy in Joel 2, 28 says, and it will come about after this. So you say, what's the big deal about saying, Peter saying, it shall be in the last days, and Joel saying, it will come about after this. Joel over here is describing the full nation of when that prophecy is fully fulfilled, and he speaks about Pentecost. Peter is highlighting primarily the Spirit's work now in the last days and then looking forward to the day that we're waiting for the Lord to return. So Peter is taking that prophecy and applying it here and applying aspects of it here so they see it, but the fullness of it that Joel spoke about, he only speaks a part of it because Joel keeps going back in his prophecy. So we can talk about that more later if you have questions, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a way that the apostles would take Old Testament literature and not change it not tamper with it, keep its context, but only apply parts of it that were necessary to see that fulfillment before the people. So, Peter's saying, you were given a prophecy by Joel. That prophecy was given and you just saw it happen before your eyes. And now think about this. And you're telling me that not only do you want to say that we're drunk, that we're drinking at 6 a.m., but now you want to say that Joel, your prophet, who spoke of this day, and prophesied of this day, you're going to say that what Joel spoke about didn't just happen? Are you really going to look back at a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy and attribute it to men as if they're drunk? So his first point to then is, men of Judea, your prophet spoke of this day. Basically, soften your heart. That's his first reason. Second reason. Second reason. They need to rethink their arrogant conclusion about attributing drunkenness to the work of the Spirit. God sent you the promised Messiah and you executed him. Peter's second point, God sent you. Now imagine if you're sitting there, you're coming to worship because you're looking forward to the future Messiah. And Peter's about to tell you, not only did Joel speak of this day, but the reason you better rethink where you're at with him is he's already come and you executed him. Think about that. Jesus came and you killed him. Now remember, this is 50 days after the crucifixion. The blood would hardly be dry on those wooden beams. <laughs> it would be known when you walked past Golgotha what had happened there 50 days earlier. And here they come, happy-go-lucky, thinking we're ready to, ready to worship God after a group of these men had been a part of the assassination plot to make sure he was executed. This is a significant moment. 
I just wonder in Peter's mind and heart if he's thinking, okay, here comes the hammer for my seeker sensitive sermon. <laughs> a non seeker sensitive sermon. That was a that was a joke. Here comes the heavy news for these men. God sent you the promised Messiah and you executed him. Verse 22. Men of Israel. Now he just addresses the men. Listen to these words. Sober up. Listen very carefully what I'm about to tell you. Jesus the Nazarene. A man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through you in your midst. Stop there. Attested is language for for proven. He's saying to them, you're here to worship God at Pentecost. God proved to you that Jesus was the Messiah and you still executed him. In fact, he proved it to you by miracles and wonders and signs. Notice verse 22, which God himself performed in your midst. Now you think about why is that so significant? Because when Jesus was here on earth during his earthly ministry, which is where, by the way, the apostles always start in their gospel presentations. They start with the earthly ministry of Jesus, then they get to the crucifixion, then the resurrection, then the ascension. It's a good gospel presentation platform. For, happens all through Acts. So he starts here with Jesus' earthly ministry And he says, you should have known he was sent from God and he was God's son because he did things that no one else could do unless he was God's, sent from God, the son of God. Just, you know, I I took from some other pastors, one in particular, he he compiled all of Jesus' miracles and wonders, or at least a a great deal of them. This is why it's so arrogant and hard-hearted that they rejected him. No, he turned water to wine, John 2. He cleansed the temple of the swindlers twice, John 2, Matthew 21. He heals a nobleman's son who is at the point of death, John 4. He healed the lame, the sick, the blind, the mute, the leopards, the demon-possessed, even on the Sabbath. He took the religious authorities to task in their teaching and in the abuse of the Old Testament. He walked on water, raised Lazarus from the dead, calmed the tempests of massive storms, fed crowds numbering 10,000 twice with enough to feed a few. He slipped through the hands of angry mobs that wanted to kill them. He slipped through the hands of trained professional guards who were commanded to arrest him. He entered Jerusalem the week before the Passover with popularity that surpassed Caesar himself, and he walked out of his own grave on the third day after the crucifixion. That's a lot of signs. End quote. I took that from a pastor. That is phenomenal. So when Peter says... Men attested to you by God, verse 22, with miracles and signs and wonders, which God performed in your midst. He's saying to them, hey guys, look back on your biography a little bit. Think about Jesus' ministry. You had plenty of evidence to accept him and respond to him. You not only had Joel that told you this, but you had Jesus' life and you executed him. Notice verse 23. Peter goes for the juggler. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. I'll I'll uh, visit that in a second. You, he makes it personal. He looks at them, he looks at them. I don't know, but he, he gets emphatic in the original here. You, nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and you put him to death. Wow. Could you imagine sitting there in the audience? having Peter look at you and say, you killed the Messiah. You executed him. You put him to the cross. It was you that put him up there. They're sitting there going, no, it wasn't. It was the Romans. And that's why he says, notice, you put him to the cross by the hands of godless men. He's saying, you pinned him to that brutal and bloody cross And you were so sophisticated and so manipulated as a Jewish nation, and you hated so much his righteousness that you even worked it out that you could get the Roman authorities to see help them believe that he was a phony and a fraud, so you could get Rome to do dirty work so you wouldn't have to do it. He's saying basically, you think you you think you didn't do it? No. You hired the assassin, you paid the assassin, you loaded the assassin's weapon, and then the assassin took care of it, and you want to take your hands off and act like you didn't do it. No. Rome may have saw it through, but you were behind it, Jews, because you rejected him as the Messiah. A trained assassin may have actually killed him, but you hired and cheered him on as he spilled the Messiah's blood. Wow. I mean, when the end of this sermon says they were pierced to the heart, you think, okay, I know why they were pierced to the heart. 
But before we get too hard on them, let's just take a moment here, just real quick, and think we should rebuke them. I can't believe that. I wouldn't have executed the Messiah. You bet you would. You bet you would have. If he was calling you to give up yourself, deny yourself, abandon everything, and follow him, and if you didn't, you'd pay for your sin, and his life was perfect, and everyone was opposing him, and it was a cost to follow him, and you didn't like that cost, and you didn't like him, and you didn't like that his righteousness made you feel unclean, you'd have been with the mob. You'd have been there. Don't think you wouldn't have. Martin Luther once said, we all carry in our pockets his very nails. You say, well, I never really grew up denying Jesus. I I came to Christ later, but I was never that hostile for him. Yeah, but it was your sin that put him there. And my sin that put him there. He had to go on that tree because of our sin, because of our unbelief. So to imagine that we're better than these men is is to miss something significant here. Peter could have pointed at us and said, you nailed him to the cross. You killed him, at least by proxy of your sin." John Stott has a great line, and I think it gets right down to the heart of why some people want to attach Jesus to their life, but they're not really saved because they never see their sin. Here's what John Stott says. Until you see the cross as that which was done by you, you will never appreciate that it was done for you. So if you think you would have been above standing with these people, then you have not seen your sin rightly. Until you see the cross as that which was done by you, you will never appreciate that it was done for you. These were the religious elite of the day coming to Jerusalem to worship the God of the Old Testament. We're we're not more seasoned than them in our religiosity. And they executed him. And C.J. Mahaney says this about John Stott's quote. I think it's a great line. Are you aware those nails in your possession. Mm. Mm. It's true, the Jewish nation would have had a significant burden here because the prophet Joel spoke of it. We're about to see that David spoke about it. But by proxy, and at least by our sin, we have to own the fact that the cross was done by us and that's why we appreciate it so much. That's why the baptisms tonight are gonna be so sweet to think about people saying, I'm in the waters of baptism, and when I go in water, it signifies I should have been judged for my sin in judgment waters, 1 Peter 4. But when I come out of those, it shows that I've trusted in Christ and been clean, and I'm brand new, and I live for him. But I should have been judged, but I'm not, because Jesus came and he was executed for me. That's baptism. One more important point to visit in this passage right here in this, in this second reason by Peter. Notice verse 23. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You may say, wait a second. He just blamed the Jews, looked them in the eyes and told them, you assassinated your Messiah, you executed him. And then right before that, he says, but while you're completely and 100% responsible God delivered and predetermined this plan by his foreknowledge long before you ever did that. Predetermined is a, is a, a, a Greek word to decide God's will of decree. It's a word that means a pre-planned event by God himself. God predetermined this fixing of this date for Jesus' execution. Foreknowledge. I know some of you come from different backgrounds. Let me tell you what foreknowledge doesn't mean. God looked forward in the corridor of time to see what would happen and then kind of worked around with it doesn't mean that. Or some will say God can anticipate the future. Doesn't mean that either. Silly. How could God be bound by time? He created time. He's always in control. The word means this, to determine an event in advance. To determine an event in advance. Let me show you how foreknowledge is used just to prove it to you. First Peter 1.20. Just listen to it. For he, Jesus, here it is, was foreknown before the foundation of the world but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. Jesus was foreknown. I know that Jesus was there in creation, right? God says, we must make man this way. We must do this. You've got the plural. The whole Trinity is there in creation. Jesus was foreknown. This word doesn't mean I don't know the future. This means I've predetermined a plan and a path. And you say, okay, 
Now my brain, pastor, it's doing that thing where I'm like, how is man 100% responsible and he blames them, but God is 100% sovereign. And then we can go into all these discussions and you'd, you'd think that Peter would go, okay, we'll tell you about a the theodicy and let me tell you about compatibilism and let me try and describe to you the nuances of you know, 100% sovereignty and 100% human responsibility. He doesn't. He doesn't blink. He believes both are true. In this sense, beloved, man is always responsible for their rebellion and their sin and God always distances himself from sin. He hates sin. But God in his sovereign plan knows how to get himself maximum glory. He knows how to exalt his name. He predetermines and foreordains a plan that maximizes his glory. And so those Jews would have been sitting there saying, I am so thankful, the ones that were softening, and we should say that God would preordain a plan to deal with my sin problem. Because had, had he not done that, I'd be going to hell for eternity. And the sin that put Jesus to the cross, that's my sin. And I thank God for both. Thank you for showing me my sin and thank you for the plan of redemption. Because without it, I'd be done. We don't need to explain these things away with philosophy. We just let the Bible speak. God's sovereign, man's responsible. I bet you in that moment, just to transition for a moment, that some of the Jews would have thought when they heard God preordain this, they would have thought Isaiah 53, 10. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. Lots of people, if you go see Christian movies, they like to blame the Romans. And they they were responsible. They like to blame the Jews, as we just saw. They're responsible for their sin. But ultimately, it was God that put Jesus on the cross and crushed him and killed him to be the redemption for our sin. And Isaiah 53 is the prophecy that said that. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. Why? So you and I could have forgiveness. So you could hear the message today about your sin and how you pinned him up there and know that you can have forgiveness if you trust in him? That's why God did it. We don't explain these tensions away. We just let the Bible speak. That's the first two reasons. Reason one, men of Judea, Joel, your own prophet, spoke of this day. You rejected it. Second one, God sent you the promised Messiah and you executed him. Reason three, This is why the Jews need to rethink attributing to God and his sovereign work and calling it drunken men. Listen to this one. David, your beloved king, spoke of the resurrection and you ignore him. If it's not enough to appeal to Joel, now you appeal to David. And when you go to David, David was their beloved king, right? The man after God's own heart, the shepherd king, the one in the line of the Messiah. And now they appeal to David. Now, if you're sitting there and you're a Jew He's already got you because you just saw you executed your Messiah. He just told you you've stiff-armed Joel's prophecy. And now he's about to be the beloved king who you look back to, who you know that David, if you're, a, if you're a faithful Jew, he is the one who the Messiah will come from his line, right? Genesis 3, a seed is promised. Genesis 12 with Abraham, it's reestablished in a promise. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. From Jacob come 12 kids, 12 tribes. One of those tribes is Judah. The tribe of Judah comes David. Jesus is from the line of Judah, the branch of Jesse. You follow your Old Testament history. When you David, you know he's a type of the foreshadowing of the future Messiah. So when they appealed to David, they just pulled back all of redemptive history and said, David spoke about today too, and you're still rejecting it. Wow. Notice verse 24. The Messiah may have been killed, but... Now, I love Martin Lloyd-Jones says, aren't you thankful for buts in the Bible? (laughs) But God raised him again. Aren't you thankful for that? Putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for Jesus to be held in its power. He's starting to introduce the idea that you may have killed him, God did preordain it, but because he's in the line of the Messiah, He cannot, look at that last line in 24. It is impossible for Jesus to be held in its power. Aren't you thankful for that? That death could not hold Jesus? Jesus drug death into the grave and then he left without it. (laughs) It is impossible for Jesus to be held in death's power. And why is it impossible, beloved? 
Because God promised from Genesis 3 to Genesis 12 through the Old Testament that a Messiah would come from the promised line and that Messiah would reign on the throne in the new heavens and the new earth. So if Jesus is actually the Messiah, then to stay in the grave of a dead man would prove he's not the Messiah. And basically that's a massive, long, he's given a big old explanation of why that's the point. The Messiah can't die. The Messiah will raise. It's impossible for him to die because God promised the Messiah will live from now through eternity. Now you can just read it with that in mind. Verse 25. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence. This is Psalm 110, by the way. For he is at my right hand, so I will not be taken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades or to hell, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full with gladness in your presence. This is a prophetic looking forward. David knew that he was in the promised line of the Messiah. And he knew even that he died, he would one day live in the future with the Messiah. And he knew that because no matter what it looked like from an earthly perspective, it happened to the Messiah. The Messiah could not be contained by death because he was the promised one. David's in the line of Jesus. Look at now, 29. He keeps going. Brethren, this just unfolds with all that in mind. I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried. They're like, duh, we know that. We know where his tomb is. And the tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him an oath to seat one of his descendants on the throne, that's Jesus, he looked ahead. Listen to this and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he, Jesus, the Messiah, was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Stop there. He just told that whole group who just rejected the resurrection account, right? They've rejected the crucifixion in saying that it was significant. They rejected the empty tomb. They're coming there. They're rejecting the spirit. They're rejecting Joel. They're realizing, he's telling them that you executed the Messiah, and then he's saying to them, Did you not read Psalm 110? David spoke about this. He spoke about a resurrection. I wonder if some of those Jews that were around Jesus in his earthly ministry were thinking, oh, this is why Jesus kept saying, have you not read? (laughs) Have you not read? Have you not read Psalm 110? That was in the prophetic line, David speaking about the future one that couldn't be contained by death? Now it's just got to be in their minds resonating. Wow. We reject Joel. We killed him. We're rejecting David. We've totally missed it. Have you not read? Wow. Then it just unfolds from here. Joel, you're off. Why should you not attribute to God supernatural works? Drunk, say that, God is acti- that God's works is like men that are drunk. Why shouldn't you attribute drunkenness to God's sovereign work? Joel, your own prophet, spoke of it. God sent the promised Messiah and you executed him. David, your beloved king, spoke of the resurrection you are now rejecting. And then four, these just unfold really quickly. Here's why you need to rethink it. Your eyewitness is a resurrection power. Now he pulls them into it and says, rejected all this scripture. You've killed the Messiah. You rejected King David. You've rejected Joel. Are you gonna sit here today and be an eyewitness of the supernatural sovereign work of God and the Spirit's work with resurrection power and still sit in your unbelief? So now he just comes for him. 32, this Jesus, God raised him again to which we are eyewitnesses. That's the 12 and the 120 that are there. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth that, look at this, look at it, end of 33. You both see and hear. He's saying to them, you're hearing with your ears and you're seeing with your eyes resurrection power. Are you really gonna sit there in unbelief? You know, I wanna say that sometimes to people that, that are in a family where they've got believers all around them and lives are transformed, the power of the gospel is transformed. All they see is transformed lives. They see power over sin. They see resurrection power. They see shedding of the old life. They see joy and contentment despite circumstances. The life of a believer. And then you've got an unbeliever in that family that's just watching it all. Watching, they're hearing it, they're seeing it, and they remain stubborn. I want to say them something. Do you not see and hear what's happening among you? All around you is resurrection power. You're really going to reject all that in your unbelief? How foolish. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, 
What you see around you is resurrection power. If you see joy, if you see contentment, if you see worship, if you see obedience, if you see people worshiping the Lord, if you see me up here excited about these truths, that's all the power of the Spirit when he indwells a life and transforms a heart. That's resurrection power. Tonight, 14 testimonies of resurrection power. How in the world could we stay and reject? Peter's saying to them, you've seen it and you've heard it. What are you doing? God crowned him Lord in Christ and you reject him. Verse 36. Wow. Notice verse 34. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but David himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. That's Psalm 110. He's talking about the sovereign work of God making Jesus King Jesus, where he'll rule and reign. 36, therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain, he grabs him by the collar again, 36, that God made him, him who? The him who you rejected, the him who Joel spoke about, the him who David was talking about, the him who you're still rejecting. God declared him Lord Christ. You not only killed the man, you killed the God man. God crowned him. So, They've seen it. And our fifth one is real easy. It sums up the whole passage. So the fourth reason, right there. There it is. Fourth reason you need to rethink it, attributing God's work to a drunken man, is your eyewitnesses. And the fifth one sums up the passage. The risen Jesus is coming to bring vengeance upon his enemies, and you executed him. Do you know why he used Psalm 110 and Joel 2? Both of those are psalms that speak about the day of the Lord, and go read them later. And you'll see about God bringing vengeance, justice. He literally says things like this. I'm going to enter into the judgment with them. I'm going to bring recompense on their head. I'm going to avenge the blood of the innocent. They just killed the innocent Messiah. So the fifth reason they need to repent is if they don't, when Jesus comes back to round up his enemies and execute them and send them into eternity, if they haven't trusted in him and repented, they will be those that are enemies. Now think about this. They thought Psalm 110 and Joel 2 was their prophecies and they would be the ones on the day of the Lord the Lord would scoop up. And he says, no, if you don't repent and trust in the Messiah, I'm gonna scoop you up and bring blood on your head for killing my innocent son. That's why he used those two Psalms. One ten, or not two Psalms, Psalm 110 and Joel 2. So now with all that in your mind, let me read the response that we're gonna study in the coming weeks. That sermon... The first Christian sermon culminated with this, verse 37. When they heard this, heard what? That Joel spoke about this, that they killed their Messiah, that David spoke about this, that they're eyewitnesses, that they've attributed God's sovereign work to, a, to drunkenness of men that can't get a hold of themselves because they're drinking before breakfast. When they heard all of that, and they heard about the resurrection and the ascension and God making him Lord, when they heard that, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? What else could they do? What else would Peter say? Repent. And each of you be baptized, which we'll see tonight, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And listen to this. And you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You too will partake in resurrection power. And you know what the Bible says? 3,000 of them came and responded and repented and were baptized and we'll study that in the coming weeks. First Christian sermon, five reasons they needed to repent with an incredible intro by the Spirit and a charge to us to make sure that we think through <laughs> our conscience and how gloriously joyful we should be as a people that are forgiven. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I will be brief because I don't want to be inconsiderate to the next class, but man, Lord, thank you for a penetrating exposition from a great preacher, preacher named Peter who laid out for us a sermon to the Jews that could not be ignored and you saved 3,000. And so we pray any that are here today that don't know you, they'd see their contribution to Jesus' execution. And those of us that love you and know you and have resurrection power, we are excited to even go hear from Pastor Jerry, a convicting sermon that's gonna call us to live differently, but that's okay. Our sins are forgiven and you want us to strive. And then tonight we hear baptisms, a resurrection power. We